biggest surprise for coming the furthest from Haywood County. Um, I'm Katie Shanahan Lindner. I'm the executive director of the Center for European Studies here at USC. Been here since early 2015, and um, teacher workshops are just the best. We're so thrilled to have you all here. Um, and this is about um, this is why I'm thrilled that. Kristen, Alina, and Emily can lead these workshops this afternoon or late morning um, to talk about right what is happening in your classrooms. And you all, the teachers, you all know your classrooms best. So we're looking forward to hearing from you and how things are going, what you need, what the discussion, um, what things are like right now in your classrooms and how we can help. And we at the center will be listening um, in terms of what kinds of resources we could potentially provide moving forward. And of course, we have these wonderful faculty with us today. To discuss this with you, um, authentic sources, how we can be, um, we, how we can have a dialogue today about how, what can improve in your classroom, how can it be different, better, what do you need? Um, you're already doing a great job, so it's not about making what you do better, but how can you use these sources in a way that makes most sense to you? I want to give a huge shout out to Dovotea. <laughs> Thank you so much um, for working with us, Valerie as well, here in the Romance Studies Department. And of course, David Lucet, the Consul General of France in Atlanta, um, for really, I mean, I think we've been talking about this for maybe 18 months, putting this on. <laughs> uh, yes, time. 18 months, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so we're thrilled, really, to have everybody here. Thanks for coming on a Saturday. Um, and I'm going to turn it right over to you in just one second. And Anne Marie Gunter is also here from the North Carolina Department of Public Instruction. And we so much appreciate your support for this event, but for all the things you do for our teachers in this state. It is so critical to have support from the North Carolina Department of Public Instruction. We couldn't do anything without you. So thank you. So David, I'm gonna turn it over to you to say a few words of welcome. Yeah, thank you, Kathleen, and good morning. Uh, my name is David Ruffel, uh, cultural attaché of the <coughs> French Embassy uh, in the Southeast region of the US. I have the great pleasure to welcome you and to introduce this very promising uh, workshop today uh, using authentic new sources in French as a foreign language classes. One of the mission of the of the French of the cultural services of the French embassy is to <coughs> organize with partners uh, workshops and training sessions for uh, teachers of French in the in the U.S. Uh, this uh, workshop today is a joint initiative of the French Embassy, the Center for European Studies at UNC, the North Carolina Department of Public Instruction, and the Department of Women's Studies at uh, UNC. Uh, I would like to warmly thank for the investment, the professionalism, and the brilliant, brilliant ideas in the prepar pre preparation of this workshop. Sorry, Kathleen Linder, Executive Director of the Center for European Studies at UNC and all our fantastic team, and Mary Gunter of the North Carolina Department of Public Instruction, Dorothea H. and Valerie Prouveau of the Department of Women's Studies at UNC, faculty members of UNC who will participate in the first one table this morning, uh, the three teachers who will lead the workshops later this morning, Alina Hunt, Emily Burroughs, and Kristen Campbell, and finally, the French team, uh, Mathieu Sell, uh, cultural attaché for education in Washington, and my team in Atlanta, uh, Lillian Daniels, and Daniela Castano Lavado. Uh, I want also to thank all the teachers who have registered and are attending this session today, either coming in person from North Carolina or attending online. You are more than 50 registered this morning from South Carolina, Tennessee, Alabama, Louisiana, Florida, Massachusetts, Colorado, et même de France. Et uh, donc, si les participants, participantes uh, de France sont, sont là, bienvenue, uh, en tout cas ce matin et pour vous cet après-midi. Uh, I will follow uh, all day long your exchanges and discussions with great with a great interest. I wish you all an excellent workshop, and I leave the floor uh, to Anne Marie Gunter, whom I thank again for her precious help and her presence this morning. Thank you so much, and welcome to everyone. Uh, as you know, I'm Anne Marie Gunter. I'm your 
World Languages Consultant at the North Carolina Department of Public Instruction. And you have just heard from my colleagues here introducing what an incredible collaboration this has been to bring you this workshop today in a hybrid format so that we could get participation from so many colleagues from across the state, um, around the country, and even um, ac across the globe. I understand we will have some folks joining us from France indeed um, sometime today. So I want to thank everyone for being here today. As, as David mentioned, he went through a very thorough list of all the partners involved in this workshop. And I want you to think about that today because because it really is a huge amount of support for the work we do in North Carolina teaching French, but also in general thinking about world language education and how we work together as teachers to make sure that we get the professional development we need so that we can better serve our students. And so this is an incredible opportunity. One thing that I always think about when we do uh, this kind of professional learning is that teachers learn best from each other. And so I wish you a very good day of learning from each other, collaborating, networking, sharing what works in your classrooms, and taking something back to your classrooms, maybe even as early as Monday morning, um, to use and, and to share with your students. So um, please, let's go ahead and get started and learn from each other. Thank you, Anne-Marie. I'm going to turn it over to Dorothea. I'm just going to say I'm sorry I don't speak French. It's really terrible, and I wish I did. So I'm just going to apologize once. Um, so I'm just going to make it very brief. I am just going to say ditto. So <laughs> if that's okay, and we can start right away. Great. Is that okay? Yes. going to feature six colleagues um, from UNC and Duke. Um, the first, I'm just going to read their names, is Samba Kamara, who is um, teaching assistant professor in African, African-American and diaspora studies. We have Jacques Pierre, uh, who is lecturing fellow of Roman studies at Duke University. Valérie Privou, teaching professor in French and Francophone studies, um, director of French language instruction here in uh, Roman studies at UNC, Hassan Malahi, professor in French and Francophone studies with a few additional affiliations in English and comparative <laughs> literature and American studies here at UNC, Lloyd Kramer, professor of history and director of Carolina Public Humanities here at UNC, and then myself, I'm also a teaching professor in the Department of Roman Studies. Um, I thought I would open this um, round table with uh, a small introduction to French media for different levels of French learners, uh, being aware that uh, no matter what level of language you teach, you can include the media, you can include news, you can include actualité, les informations, in the many, many ways um, that are appropriate for the level that you teach. And so that's what I'm hoping to convey to you in a second. Here we are. Wonderful. Yes. So um, just a short um, remark on where I came from. I usually teach every semester our one requirement for UNC French majors and minors. That's the French uh, composition and grammar review. Um, and it's a 300 level language class um, in which um, everything that we do lends itself to being um, made into uh, a news item, starting with the present tense, asking questions, negation, uh, past tenses, future conditional tenses uh, that you can uh, 
uh, direct according to supposed facts, et douteux non confirmé, subjunctive, my wishes for the world, I wish that, etc. Um, and then everything, sort of this, this covers um, the range of grammar topics that I teach. I start with the news right away um, in the first chapter when I present the present tense and questions. Um, and here's just one little example, les distractions, where I move my students from sport slowly into whether they are interested in news at all and how they access them. And they usually are pretty forthcoming. And when that's happened, I introduce this um, a net guide of this unit. Uh, that gives you access to a lot of news media in one page. It's made for senior citizens, but it's uh, well done for uh, people from all walks of life. And it's very useful. Um, so you have here the international um, websites, the international platforms with uh, news, and then you can move, um, you can sort of move through those. And they also have, of course, the French news media outlets and um, then I follow that up with a short introduction to uh, La Presse Française, uh, French media that are can be said to constitute uh, the fourth estate, le quatrième pouvoir in France. Um, they have, the French media has an important role in the cultural um, and intellectual life in France, maybe more so than here, although all of that it can be debated. But this is the kind of small introduction I give at different levels. So this is very, you can adapt that to different levels of French learners. Am I uh, comprehensible to everyone? Can everyone hear me all right? Good. Um, so then I usually follow this, uh, depending on the level, you can adapt this to what you uh, would like to uh, your students to know. And I'm happy to make this available to all the participants online and um, in person afterwards. Um, with the, with the uh, large um, journals, the, the daily journals, and I give some little blurbs about where they stand. Um, in, in their publications, making it clear that in France, uh, news publications uh, have clear affiliations, they don't hide them, um, and everyone knows where they are on the political spectrum. I uh, spend a little bit of time on the Monde Diplomatique, which is, gives access to a lot of news sources we don't usually get to see in this country. And then the mag magazines, Revue, um, same thing, and uh, once again, you can adapt that to what you would like your particular classes uh, to know, um, and uh, sort of with regard to the degree of completion that you want to engage in. Here on the right are useful web websites from France TV Info to uh, Francophonie, um, and then uh, here once again the net guide of DC Note, and we also have something uh, parallel for kids, and that's the net guide, um, where you have a similar setup, and it's for children from uh, age ranging from age six to fourteen adolescents, um, and starting with uh, l'actu, un jour une actu. Um, so uh, that's the one that I often use. I have to be a little bit careful in my 300 class not to get carried away because then they ask me, is that all we know how to do act two for kids? Um, but usually they like it very much. So as an example here is Actualité pour enfants. They just debated this week the um, that la loi for the retirement uh, in France, retirement age being raised from 62 to 64, and they do a really good job explaining that to children. So this is uh, also can be adapted to different levels of language learners. Um, here is what they had for this week. Um, they had uh, you, uh, men in Iran putting on veils. Um, they had uh, le coup de la vie, so inflation in France, that's a perennial and has been for a while. And then they also had le nouveau danseur étoile, who happens to be from Senegal. It's uh, Guillaume Diop, um, and they have a little um, thing on him. Um, interestingly, Quebec has uh, Le Curieux, and uh, in their blurb, they say they would like to make um, uh, make enlightened citizens out of their young people, and so that's part of their uh, uh, platform. And I love this magazine. You can magazine it here. Um, 
And then I usually close it with an overview of Les Partis Politiques en France. And once again, you can adapt that to different levels of language learners with regard to how deep you want to go into it, into the history of the parties. Um, uh, the students at all levels are usually interested in Les Républicains and how that name came about and who did it, who brought that name about. And then in the idea of Sarkozy as a uh, French president who really wanted to model his campaigns and his, uh, his office according to American um, uh, sort of, um, yeah, in, uh, sort of images um, and uh, who was called uh, President Bling Bling. They all find that funny. Um, and uh, so um, here, uh, a lot of the students are interested in the new party by Eric Zemmour, and so we can go into that. Um, but for uh, younger um, younger students, um, I usually sort of limit it to the main parties, and I don't go too much into the history. What's interesting to most American students is that we have a Parti Socialist and we have a Parti Communist, and that warrants some discussion even on the lower levels of, uh, for, for, for lower uh, levels of language learners. And that's uh, pretty much um, most of what I do. Um, and I'm happy to uh, uh, pass uh, it on to Samba. And uh, would you like to come here? Would you like me to move it along? You can also do it from there. Uh, I can stand there. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, thank you, Dorothea, for bringing me into this very uh, important uh, workshop. Uh, because French is a global language, not just a language of the French, so I think my contribution will be more of an emphasis of uh, the global aspect of uh, French uh, with a specific focus on Senegal, which is my, 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 my native uh, country. So um, my contribution to today's conversation will focus on the importance of um, uh, the use of authentic materials uh, in teaching African cultural uh, components in a French language class. So what I mean by authenticity, as all of you know, is just, you know, um, the capacity of the pedagogical material or the uh, classroom activities to reflect uh, culture specific and uh, real life uh, situations of the target French speaking uh, society, in my case, um, Senegal. So um, in order to achieve that goal, then the starting point is you know after the, the, the selection of authentic materials meaning that material that allows the teacher to really prioritize cultural content and really real life situations and like i said i'll focus here on uh, uh Senegal, which is a french speaking uh west african country as uh, you all know uh and being a scholar of popular culture that's what i teach here at unc as well as african literature my country will definitely speak to my background. Um, uh, an example of uh, um, uh, 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 sort of francophone content uh, that can be used as part of material is um, Senegalese hip hop media. Uh, and an example uh, that I have here to show is Le Journal Rapé, which is a Senegalese sort of iconic um, hip hop TV show that provides local and international news um, uh, uh, to its origins through a declamation of uh, hip hop style uh, music. And this kind of material can be used to talk about uh, themes such as Senegalese politics, uh, social issues, economy, development, popular culture, et cetera. And a lesson plan using this material can um, target the kinds of linguistic competencies around urban vocabulary uh, in Senegal, French neologism, which has hugely been produced by hip hop, uh, not just in Senegal, but in the rest of the continent. And also, oral devices of communication can also be uh, uh, emphasized here. 
I still don't know if I have time to play some of this criteria, just to give you a taste of sure. okay. progress. Not getting a response from, let's see. You have to share, try sharing the sound. Yeah. You share sound. Yeah, on the left. Uh, I'm not sure that'll do it, but yeah. if you haven't checked that, we get. Uh, Come here. <laughs> go back to screen share. Yeah, and then check. Check to yeah. share sound. Yeah. And, and op optimize for video. Uh, yeah. That's... Right. And then. Yeah. And then we're just. Yeah. And the other one, the one we Oh, here we go. Yeah. <laughs> Bienvenue, installez-vous, on a des nouvelles pour vous. Il y a des bonnes, il y a des mauvaises, mais il y a des nouvelles pour vous. Bienvenue, installez-vous, on a des nouvelles pour vous. Il y a des bonnes, il y a des mauvaises, mais il y a des nouvelles pour vous. Le séisme des locales continue de faire des ravages, des dommages collatéraux et beaucoup de remue ménage. Ma qui n'a pas d'amis, il n'a que des intérêts. Celui qui n'a pas de base politique se fait très vite enterré. Par contre, qui gagne les élections sera lui récompensé dans le gouvernement de Mohamed John. Il all right, so if you, uh, I'm more than happy to share these links with uh, us there, and it, it would lead you to the whole series. This, this has been running through all the last eight years, so that can be used as a set of. Uh, another source for sort of teaching this authentic, um, uh, of these authentic materials is Senegalese tell films. Um, and an example of that is Selavia Hatanga, which is uh, a, a telefilm that's been produced in collaboration between Senegalese and French uh, producers and, and film directors. And this is a uh, series that portrays the routine of five um, Senegalese um, hospital employees uh, in Dakar. And so two of them are midwives. Uh, one is a medical doctor, a male medical doctor, and the fourth is the doorman. So what's interesting about it is that it provides you uh, the perspectives of five different people. And in that way, it sort of, sort of takes you through the profundities of, of diversity in Senegalese um, society. And you see different layers of the French language being used here. Uh, various types of vocabularies, you know, that that, that can easily be adapted uh, for a particular um, uh, purpose. Um, again, themes can focus on friendship, right, depending on the needs of the French teacher, health, family planning, related vocabulary, family problems, tradition, modernity uh, uh, in health, etc. Um, and and this can be a material that can uh, be used to um, uh, Teach the particularity or the peculiarity of Senegalese French. By the way, there is a dictionary of Senegalese French, as there is a dictionary of Ivorian French, etc. Et so that's just to highlight the global um, aspect of, of the French um, language. And again, this link will take you to other episodes of this uh, series. And lastly, I think a, a set of authentic material that I want to share uh, is um, uh, uh, this. Um, um, a set of um, lesson plans based on authentic materials that, uh, which is an outcome of a recent uh, materials development uh, project that was led by uh, UNC's African Studies Center, um, in which I was a part of. Um, but I was 
in this project just as an expert reviewer. Uh, what happened was that we had recruited a group of wonderful K through 12 um, teachers who were part of the team and we sent them to Senegal to immerse themselves in the culture and to um, also um, perform, they recorded themselves performing a set of uh, cultural um, 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 dramas, which became part of those authentic materials that informed the lesson plans that they produced. And so um, yesterday I was just finishing up reviewing the batch two, uh, which I have um, finalized and these will go live in the website of the UNC library, as well as in the website of the African Studies Center and can be used by any teacher to, to, um, uh, to adapt. Of course, here yeah, adaptation is a key, key term, given that the material is targeting originally um, English uh, students. But because the focus here is authenticity, I think um, uh, the, the, if I have time, I can just take you to um, maybe uh, what I was looking at yesterday here. These are uh, already pre-designed, um, Okay, so um, this is an example here. I do not like the way that this is spelled here, but um, yeah, so this link, the link takes you to uh, this lesson plan here, for example. This is a ready made lesson plan. And it has companion media um, that includes a uh, PowerPoint. They can't see it. Share. Okay. So this is the lesson plan. You can see some notes there, but this is what you would, what you would see if you go to the website once it goes live. Uh, it, it has links to um, PowerPoints that um, contain those authentic materials. Let's, let me see if I can get to this. No, it's it's fine. Uh, yeah, you can you can you can. I will, I will share the links. Yes, and, and, and we'll make sure everybody gets everything. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. I'm telling everyone in the chat too. You'll get it all. Everyone is very excited in the chat about your resources. Thank you. Oh, oh, it's a map. Thank you. I don't think it's on the way. No. But from I have one. I put it. I No, I need them. Oh, uh, no, 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 no
My name is Valérie Pouveau, and I teach a variety of courses at UNC Chapel Hill. Um, so uh, same as Dorothea, yeah, I do teach the, the grammar course, and I also use news a little bit differently in that I will, for example, see articles um, sometimes on Instagram, right? Le Monde will share parts of articles and have a number of pictures and uh, well, there's grammar that we are talking about that day. So seeing the grammar in action as well as potential reactions from students. Um, so Instagram is a great place to kind of pull short news. Uh, also, uh, I used uh, Info France, uh, France Info, uh, and just pull snippets uh, from there to then move the discussion along and really talk about the grammar being used, uh, such as coming back to past subjunctive and how it's used in an article or the passé simple versus passé composé en partie. Uh, I also teach uh, conversation courses as well as uh, current societal issues in France and the Francophone world. And that one really concentrates on what is happening in France and the Francophone world. Uh, so, and it gives a lot of freedom for students to bring in and think about for them to research what is happening in the Francophone world and to find, um, maybe consider what is the state of uh, prisons or hospitals or uh, uh, political issues, elections in countries. Uh, and they really enjoy presenting on that. At lower levels, such as Intermediate French 2, uh, we have uh, dans le Dans le monde francophone. So they really, uh, this is a space for students to also start seeing and start reading shorter articles uh, that we, we shorten. Uh, and of course, then there comes that point of, well, what do we do with these articles, right? It's not just about reading them and finding authentic uh, material. It's also about making it relatable to students, make it accessible. Uh, so we're always thinking about the I plus one and then thinking about, well, what kind of questions? So whether it is, first of all, pre-reading questions, so pre-lecture, to get them into the topic uh, at every level. Uh, and that pre-lecture can really, those questions can really vary. Um, so if it is an article, for example, about art in France and how, or, and around the world, really, there's been some uh, uh, attacks uh, on art and from ecological uh, groups. Uh, so groups who are, who want to protect uh, uh, the earth and ecology and who have been throwing soup, for example, on works of art, or you may have heard of throwing paint on uh, doors or works of art. And so uh, a short, an article was short and very accessible to students at that level. It actually referred back to vocabulary that was in their book. It just worked out really well for them. But thinking about mixing the environment that students are very interested in, uh, which are topics that they can certainly talk about, as well as art that they have been um, studying and vocabulary with that. And so thinking about how to merge, bridge what they are learning and the goals of the course, as well as authentic materials. And then in thinking of the importance of questions and discussion, first having, thinking about questions that are relatable, accessible to students. Will students be able to answer questions, be able to tease out, understand the material and explain it? Uh, and then discussion, that can be difficult at every level, right? What are students able to do at each level for that discussion? What kind of, what comes, um, what becomes a difficulty is vocabulary a lot of times. So providing that vocabulary, uh, thinking ahead of questions that they may have. And I think what always comes up is their questions. Uh, and that's always sometimes a really great exercise of not providing questions and having students write questions, think of questions together. What kind of questions would they ask the person who is talking in the article? Uh, what kind of questions would they ask for to the government or to Elizabeth Bourne about the uh, count? Uh, well, uh, what kind of questions can they come up with uh, themselves and at every level that is going to evolve? And then discussion, giving them space to react and thinking about difficult questions, right? That students can sometimes ask us, so, but the topic depending, we have to think ahead about what kind of difficult questions do they have? 
doesn't mean we have all the answers. And sometimes that may be the best answer of, I don't have the answer, but you could certainly go and look it up or we don't know what will happen next. Make sure to check the news on Monday uh, to see what will happen. So uh, really thinking of in advance and having a, quite a list of discussion questions that even if we provide questions and uh, in advance to students, thinking about additional questions that we could ask or that they may have, thinking in advance about the answers to the questions um, at every level, and then really allowing that space for students to discuss and um, to ask more questions really at that point, which may let the, lead them to more discovery and really engages those critical thinking skills that we want to see. Okay. Hi uh, everyone, my name is Pierre. I'm from Shandy. Sorry. Okay. okay, so let me start with this. Uh, so technically, I was supposed to talk about you know, French and Haiti, how you can find resources. Um, uh, are there, you know, learning French a lot about Haiti? But talking about Haiti, it's kind of like difficult not to talk you know, about real, like Asian real. So as uh, I put it here, Haiti is almost, almost a Creole-speaking country. So that's you know the, the first thing. So the entire population speaks Creole. However, there's a tiny minority whose French is the second language. So like that. So technically, we're not sure how much it is. Maybe 10, 15, 20. What we know for sure out of the population. The, the Zoom room can't hear you. Could you speak a little bit louder? Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, as I said, you know, earlier, Haiti is first foremost um, a Creole speaking country. So we can't tell, you know, for sure, you know, what percentage of the population speaks, you know, the language. But uh, we know for sure half of the population doesn't speak it. So that's why, you know, we said, you know, Haiti is a Creole. Speaking country. Since 1804, the official documents are exclusively written in French. Since 1804, as you know, declared its independence in 1804. Uh, in 1918, during the American occupation, French became the official language. So it's from 1804 to 1917, so there was no official language in him. But before you know, is to speak Creole, and then tiny percentage you know, of the population you know, speak in the French. Uh, now, where you can find you know, materials you know, written in French, in Haiti, first, you know, Le Nouvel is kind of like old, and then Aigo Post in uh, newspaper, Alter Press, Le National. And Haiti, those five. So there are a bit more of those five, especially the novelists. But they are not exclusively, you know, in French, because in the last, you know, twenty years, there's a lot of effort, you know, from a lot of people in Haiti to promote Creole. 
And then you can find sometimes some articles written, the titles are in Creole, but the content, you know, in French. Sometimes you know, they're kind of like both. Okay. So there are a few more resources in French. So that's what I that's why I said, you know, Creole speaking country, because we cannot really find like maybe 10 or 15 percent of like French, you know, broadcast, you know, in Haiti. So most of the time, it's like everything you know, in Creole. Now, one resource is I can one resource I can mention it's like Metropolitan Point, because this broadcast is very non-uniform using you know French. But the last 20 years, there are a lot of you know guests you know in the show who speak both Creole you know, and French together. Now, depending on the guest, depending on the guest, because if you invite someone uh, who's not like school at high level you know, in Haiti, so you have no choice. Maybe you start the conversation you know, in French, and then after you know, we switch you know, right to Creole. And then even if now you know, the guest knows you know, French pretty good, but he has no choice or she has no choice. She has to move or he has to switch you know, to Creole if you really want you know, everyone to understand you know, what he's talking about. So technically, uh, like, you know, we cannot really say like, you know, when you pay, you know, it's like an environment, but you will find, you know, French, like, you know, all the time. So depending, you know, on the family, depending, you know, on the person, and then depending, you know, even, you know, on the time too. Uh, so let's just see, you know, like French, Haitian, Creole, and English. You know, Haiti, Creole, and French are the two official languages. In 1987, uh, 1918, French became the official language. In 1987, that's when Creole became the official language. Before, you no know, Creole, you know, as official language at all. Since that moment, and a lot of people you know, have been pushing to use Creole more and more. Now, if you go, if you are in Haiti, like in the 1970s, 80s, put that okay. The, there's a lot of French, you know, in, the, like in terms of language. But nowadays, mostly you will find a lot of writers in, in French to write in you know, like novels, um, poems, you know, all those things. Lately, in the last like 10 years, there are more and more writers writing you know, in Creole than, than French. And then one of the things is like, if you know, if you speak Creole, uh, you can you know understand you know like French Creole are the same thing in the French. It's kind of like not too complicated, you know, to understand you know Creole. Um, I cannot really talk too much you know, about Africa because technically I don't feel I'm African, and then it's like a big continent, you know, talk about you know Africa in this five minutes. I think just two countries like uh, Mali and the Senegal, and I use you know, those uh, resources just to get myself you know, informed about this country. And then how I can use you know, materials to you know, form the newspapers, because the other thing that I use, I teach you know, it's about, like, and then it's about Haiti, and then how Haiti is very connected to Africa in terms of language. But even you know when we talk about Senegal, when we talk about Mali, I think you know, argue with me, kind of like you know the same thing. You know, half of the population doesn't speak French, even if we name them, you know, like French-speaking countries. And then that's the movement now you hate. Just make sure for people to stop even French behaving as a Francophone country. But there's like a a debate, you know, about that is it like a Francophone country or Creole speaking country. But for many, many people, they think they should name it like Francophone country because the French language is, you know, it's kind of like this prestige when talking, you know, about the Haiti 
and then Creole language, even if it was spoken by the internal tradition, for some people feel like it's just still for the local speech. Because technically, they don't really use it, you know, at all levels of school and education. There's black and black and deep in that now, and then people feel like, okay, now this is our language. If we need to promote it, we need to use it, and then you're not gonna find, you know, a newspaper like we are here, where everything is like one hundred percent French, and then while reading, you know, news about Haiti on those newspapers, you know, just you can find maybe three, four, five, you know, sentences, you know, in Creole. So that's why you know, I said not only. It is just in a course in the country, but whenever you know, read a novel, this, you know, like news, whatever, always, you know, expect to find some queer, you know, in it. Yeah, that's all I can say. Do we have this? Do we have the uh, we have the Zoom room back? Is it okay? All right. Well, here I'll just bend over a little bit so that the microphone picks up my voice. Uh, okay, I'm gonna. Uh, I don't. I don't have a lot to say uh, actually because it might be the exercise I'm going to talk about, which is very very specific and limited to one class I did. It was a class in translation. It was. Uh, I I had decided to. Well, we decided in the in a in a French program at UNC to teach a class on translation. I was an experienced, I am an experienced translator. Is uh is are we, are we broadcasting? Okay, good. Uh, yeah, I'm an experienced translator. So well, let's 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 introduce the students to translation and not just the practice of translation, but the theory of translation. There's a wonderful collection called the uh, the the translation studies reader. And I think the students benefited quite a lot from it. I'll say just a little bit about it to contextualize the exercise I'm going to describe, which involves simply finding news articles uh, that the students that were available for the students to translate. Um, and this course was, I did teach it when the pandemic was in full swing. It was uh, it was on Zoom, uh, masks, everything where it was going on. It was, it was uh, and this is, this is pertinent, uh, just foregrounding the, uh, um, this, uh, this, this, that, yeah, that, the fact that it was the pandemic is per, uh, during the pandemic is, pan, uh, is pertinent to the introduction to news articles I'm about, I'm about to give to you because it was just, it was what was, of course, on everyone's mind. Um, but anyway, the translation studies at first is that we began with very early Western translation theory from St. Jerome, who translated the Bible. Actually, some really super interesting things to say about translating a text you can't comprehend. Because uh, he admitted to not being able to understand a word of much of the Bible, um, and you know that's that's something that students can relate to. You're reading a text you don't quite, you don't you don't understand it. So what what do you do with it? And then uh, other just uh, other translation theorists. I mean, up through Kwame Anthony Appiah, who's still an active professor at the University of at New York University, but uh, Friedrich Nietzsche, uh, Goethe. Uh, Schleiermacher, trend, trend, classics translation theory, Vata Benjamin, but the thrust was to teach students that um, translation involves also not simply transposing one language to another, but also um, introducing into one into one culture aspects of another culture and actually then uh, in a way that can transform that culture, transform the thinking of the people reading the translation. Uh, right. open them to something outside their own culture. So I was mainly concentrating on literary translation. We used fairly fairly standard literary works, metro, you know, uh, hexagonally centered uh, for the most part, the Marguerite Duras, um, and, uh, and, 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 and also Charles Baudelaire. Uh, and of course, Google Translate came up and I said, please avoid this, even though I did say, let's try putting a Baudelaire poem through. And I, the last time I tried a poem, uh, putting a poem through Google Translate, gibberish came out. But there, there was actually some pretty good literal translations of some of Baudelaire's verses. I mean, of course, the, the, the sonnet structure was gone. 
but the the rhymes and so forth and the, and, and the meter but it, it was actually a pretty good literal translation but i said avoid this i mean uh just just don't do it but we're gonna look at what this does this is part of translation but anyway so when it came to the uh news articles i thought okay what are we going to do we're going to look at something that is familiar to the students very familiar to the students which is the situation of the pandemic and mandates and the restrictions they have to live under and so forth uh but in a in 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 uh in in France, which is similar in a lot of ways, I mean, a similar kind of I mean, an ostensible democracy and a uh, with with uh, a bureaucratic government that has has the that can exercise the authority of imposing mandates, things like labor unions, and, and, and even though their function is quite different in France. Um, so I, I picked something, uh, just some, some articles on the use of masks in France from Le Monde, I mean, a very accessible, you know, just very, 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 very present source. I think most students had heard of the newspaper and it's readily available through the UNC library. I think most university libraries subscribe to the mold. Um, and, uh, and I just focused on, I found articles. Well, okay, and this was just, I'm gonna get them to translate. So this is during the pandemic. They're, they're having a lot of trouble paying attention to anything, but what can they pay attention to? Something that's very close to their own situation. And I wanted to foreground things like uh, the response, well, the resistance, the resistance to the mask mandates, which came largely from the left in France, as opposed to the right in the US. And so part of the translation exercise was to discuss why that might be. I mean, is it because we elected a president on the right who was, who was, who was leading the opposite, well, more or less leading the opposition or pretending to at least, that it wasn't so much the left in the United States. And we, we I looked at things like labor unions. Uh, there were articles on that the labor unions were actually fighting the mass mandates. I mean, the healthcare workers and um, things like, uh, um, let me see, the uh, an official in the nurses union who said it's not, it's, it's, it isn't a public decision, it's an individual decision whether to wear a mask. And I asked students, okay, what is, um, how would that go over in the U.S.? I mean, can you imagine somebody in a union, in a healthcare union in the United States, saying this has nothing to do with the public interest or the interest of my work situation? It has an it has to do with my interest only? And I said, does this does, does this match what you understand? Because the students are they're all many of them are convinced that France is a hardcore socialist country. Mm -hmm. I said, how does this jive with your idea of France as a hardcore socialist country, um, where you know people on people on the left. Are, are are saying things that sound a lot like you know the, the radical individual rights people on the right in the United States okay but anyway this was just it was a challenge to them and I think that just the, the, the subject and the the similarity and difference the simultaneous similarity and difference to their own situation was a way of inviting them into looking closely at the news source and and translating it and then then doing the basic the basic skill trend transposition of one language to another. Thank you very much. Okay, I'm just going to sit here. I hope I can be seen and heard from this location. I'm Lloyd Kramer and I'm professor in the history department. So I'm kind of the outlier here in that I'm not teaching French. I don't teach in French and I don't teach students who want to study French history, but I give it to them as in, in every way that I can. So I'm teaching a course on um, the history of cross-cultural encounters, the, the way in which Americans have encountered France. Uh, I also talk at times about how the French have viewed America, and I often use cultural history sources that are classic courses, uh, uh, sources like Voltaire or Rousseau or Tocqueville or uh, modern um, novelists. But I'm also very interested in helping students understand both their similarity and difference from France. In other words, French culture provides a site of dialogical exchanges. And one of the, I often use James Baldwin's Notes of a Native Son when she's talking about living in Paris. Um, I use other sources, David Sedaris, who grew up in Raleigh and wrote this book, Me Talk Pretty One Day. Do you know this book? And he tells about studying French at the Alliance Francaise, and the students love it because it's so funny. I know this isn't a way to learn French, but it helps them understand the experience of being in a different culture. And that's one of my main goals. Another text I often use is, is Gertrude Stein's uh, text called Paris, France, in which she says, 
writers have to have two countries, the one where they belong and the one in which they live really. The second one is romantic. It is separate from themselves. It is not real, but it is really there. In other words, you have to be able to be both where you came from and in another place at the same time. And a writer, a creative person, a creative thinker moves between cultures. And this is what I want students to understand about um, Paris in particular, but France more generally. I've often used also uh, Hemingway's A Movable Feast, where he says, if you are lucky enough to have lived in Paris as a young person, then wherever you go for the rest of your life, it stays with you for Paris is a movable feast. Why do I do this? Because most of these students, they are not studying French, but almost all of them are planning to do study abroad. What does it mean to go to another part of the world, particularly to France? So let me just note very quickly, what I'm trying to do is help them understand a transatlantic history in which America, or specifically the United States and France, have shared traditions and intellectual and political goals, but in inevitably differences, ways in which they interpret these in different ways. So for example, they both are part of a transatlantic 18th century revolutionary culture that creates ideas of human rights, of republicanism, anti-monarchism, um, and then develop ideas of democracy. But then they both fall short of this because women are excluded, uh, people of color are excluded. It's a long struggle to carry these ideas forward. France and the United States share these traditions, these shortcomings, these struggles. And uh, so, for example, the French abolished slavery before the uh, people in the United States, but the United States um, made more progress on women's rights. So what does that mean? How do we understand similarity and difference? Um, France also has a very long history of extreme polarization, going back to the wars of religion, going through the French Revolution, going through the Dreyfus Affair. And how do people in France cope with the problem of extreme polarization, which can lead to violence, scapegoating, um, endless um, social crises having to do with extreme polarization? I want students to see that France offers resources to think with other cultures. Um, there's also, of course, differences that I always try to stress. Uh, that the French have a longer tradition of stressing the arts and literature as essential for national identity, national achievements. The French stress more the pleasures of food and drink. And when they come to America, they almost always have said Americans don't know how to eat, they don't know how to drink, and they don't know how to have long, long dinners. They just wolf down their food. Of course, now the French go to McDonald's, so maybe that's not so similar, so different. Um, and the French have always said that work is not the most important aspect of human life. They like long vacations. They take, um, um, they, they, they want to retire earlier. Let's just put it that way. So, um, so what I want American students to understand is that France's history, conflicts, achievements show how history is always central to human lives and human identities. They can look at France and see the nature of nationalism, anxiety about national decline, desires to claim that their culture is not just French culture, but universal culture, also something in the United States. So in the end, my goal is to help students understand that nobody can ever fully understand their own culture or their own identity without understanding another culture and its language and its history. And the other is always essential to the construction of the self. And French history, French culture, French literature offers a culture to think with and also a culture to think against. And that is why French perspectives are so important for what I do in my classes. And I'll just mention in conclusion that when students come to see me and they say they're going to France to study or to work, I often give them magazines like this, Vogue's, 
um, because of the perspective on contemporary issues. Here's one recently on how the French view the war in Ukraine, or here the French dealing with the problem of the far right and Marine Le Pen, or here French views of Israel and the struggle in the Middle East, or here chat, GPT, a new, you know, how do we deal with this? Or French views of life in the office. These are incredibly helpful ways of just handing something to a student and saying, I know this is probably beyond your reach, but try to read what the French are saying about these issues. All of which I think is the way to help people understand the particularity of American identity, its difference and similarities with France. That's what I do, and I do it in English with, you know, that's how I do it. Malheureusement. <laughs> Thank you very much for all the uh, presenters in the round table. We are moving on right away. Please keep your questions uh, and let them let what we just heard sink in. We have a debriefing session this afternoon where we can come back to all these presentations. Um, we have um, Alina Hunt, uh, who will lead her workshop, uh, Techniques of Discussion in Room 1009. We have Emily Burrs, who will talk about the resources available to teachers and students in room 3033. And we will have Kristen Campbell, who is talking about the different components of a pedagogical unit for different levels of language learners in room 3024. And this is where we are moving next. Um, thank you once again to the presenters and uh, I will um, introduce uh, David Ruffel, cultural attaché, director of Villa Albertine in Atlanta, and he has kindly offered to be one of our facilitators. Uh, we may not need a facilitator, but uh, David is also here to let us know about um, resources uh, at our disposal, at your disposal. Um, and so the topic of this um, afternoon session is interstate dialogue on challenges and opportunities um, some of them already arose from our lunch discussions, and I'm sure that all online participants have things to contribute. So uh, here goes, David, um, you are visible. He's connecting to audio still. So. Oh. <laughs> Sorry. We heard your... Okay. Now I can touch Here are other people wanting to Yep. Everyone's here. Oh, now everyone. Great, thank you. David, can you hear us? Uh, yes. Wonderful. We already introduced you <laughs> while you were connecting. So uh, um, we are ready for our afternoon session, Interstate Dialogue on Challenges and Opportunities. I think everyone knows what uh, we would like to discuss, and we are also here to listen to you um, start, us, start us off. Uh, all right, so uh, good afternoon, everyone. So we are starting this uh, Interstate Dialogue. Um, so thank you for all the contributors this morning. Uh, it was really, really interesting. Uh, I guess that you have uh, some some questions uh, for I don't have from the from the the French embassy. Uh, I can give you uh, some very well known uh, sources uh, that most of you already know. Uh, so I let me just uh, a few minutes to to remind you that. Uh, uh, France Education, Fred, uh, is uh, a website that you can, where you can find some different good uh, authentic sources. Uh, maybe you probably know Lumni uh, as well. Uh, at L'Institut Français, 
uh, EF Cinema. You can register on EF Cinema uh, to have access to many, many movies, many, many films. Uh, of course, TV 5 Monde, facile. Uh, it will be my, my main contributions uh, because very original, very new uh, resources this morning. I am uh, available to uh, eventually uh, answer and present you our uh, network in the US. Um, this morning during a workshop, uh, one of you um, asked me about uh, uh, our presence as uh, the US, the French U uh, embassy in the US, our presence uh, in the in the Southeast. So I am uh, here to answer your question and eventually to present uh, the uh, French cultural services in the US. Yeah, so then we could uh, um, open the floor for questions, concerns, um, challenges and opportunities with regard to teaching news uh, in particular, but in with regard to teaching languages in general. And uh, so we take questions from the online participants as well as from in-person participants here in Chapel Hill. Anybody want to start? I think a concern with teaching the news is I'm from a very rural area, a very conservative area. And so I think just framing the news in a way, I love how France, the publications, they say what party they're leading. And one thing I had a student do, she is a special interest topic. She did the political parties and she put all the players on like a board with their parties on it. And I think whenever there's elections, having those conversations with students with like what papers are leaning, what political ways. But I think that's something that I need help with is how to talk about politics in French in a way that's I'm just presenting this and not giving any personal at all. I think that's one thing that I need help with. Because that I have a lot of conservative families in my district that aren't open-minded. So framing it where it's just education and not, I think that's something that I struggle with. Does anyone have any good ideas? On yeah, and this is something that if I may uh, chime in here, and that was the reason why I presented things uh, at the beginning of the round table, because we have the same challenge, of course, in our uh, student population, um, who are either a bit reluctant to talk about news, to read about the news, um, to confront the news, unless it's through their social media networks uh, or platforms. And so um, that is something, that's one of the reasons why um, I like to introduce it very early um, and to show them that at every stage of their language learning, they can um, access it and that France and the French cultural services and the uh, services that deal with French spoken in other, in, in areas outside of France, that there are many, many resources available that um, cater to this interest and that are also geared toward different levels of language learners, but also toward, uh, toward, toward different age groups. Um, and I think that helps a lot because when um, students start out learning the language or when they are exposed to news for the first time, uh, the ludic approach is often useful uh, when it is presented to children. And uh, so it is a playful approach that enables them to, well, they find it fun. Um, and it's also presented in a way that is attractive. So with a lot of images, um, with a lot of uh, captions that are easy to understand and uh, to, uh, uh, well, grammatically analyze if you teach a grammar class. So, um, so the... I've 
in in the many years that I've taught the news in a class that's not about news, um, I've come to the conclusion in my own for my own teaching that um, when I when it's introduced, it's best to do it through uh, the viewpoint of younger people, younger people than the students that I teach, mm. and so that gets them. Uh, to see that, yeah, yeah they, they're interested in it. So we should, so should we. Yeah. If they can do it, if they want to engage with it, so should we at our level and as grow, a comparative grown up. Mm -hmm. um, so comparatively speaking. Um, so that's been my approach, my approach and uh, it's been, yeah, it's worked. I think with some of that too, um, you were asking about how do we kind of have those discussions, right? Have those mm -hmm. questions. and asking this so finding maybe an article where there are both points more than one point of view is all as i find tends to be helpful of course just one point of view and having the students then uh tease out what is the point of view and therefore what are other points of view and finding it themselves is a good it's a good way to work with that but also just you know having them see different just say this is the point of view, right? Yeah. There's no opinion attached at that point. It's just what are the different points of view? That's all they're doing. Um, before they can then maybe consider, okay, well, but then they usually do react of, yeah. well, why, why this? Or, uh, but I don't like that. Okay, well, tell me why. Um, so then they can react afterwards, but maybe just kind of slowly bringing them to just the understanding mm -hmm. of what it is that they're reading what are they looking at to before they can even express their own opinion about it um tends to be what we also see um at different levels of course and sometimes they have an opinion they're just not able at that point in time right they don't, may not have the language skills or you they might have conversation they may need more time to consider what they think and respond and they might be able to do it in english but not quite yet in yeah. french too yeah well that you feel free to unmute okay thank you uh my question is about how we can set up a global a global uh, document to um, for a unit unit global document so that we can uh, have all information for level uh, in it so we can develop our contents our uh, uh, class class activities from this uh, document referral document. Is it possible to think about this? Because all day as teacher, we have uh, to find a content and develop each uh, week uh, some content. But if you have a document, a global document in French, we can uh, go there and then have the content to, to teach. Thank you. Yeah, this is, um, if I may say so, uh, the Center for European Studies has content uh, at its disposal and so do the French cultural services. So if Katie and David would like to chime in here, that would be really wonderful. Mm -hmm. Happy to. Um, so um, we have, and um, could you put the, uh, our site in the chat. Um, we have uh, a lesson plans that from teachers for teachers, right? So um, many, many, many that have been written. Um, Alina, Emily are two examples um, that you can uh, that are free and open, and everyone uh, can use as um, as guidelines. And of course, they're not all for teachers of French. Um, but they have, um, I mean, it's European content, right? And some of it is specific on the European Union. Um, but there are all different kinds of approaches um, and for all different grade levels. Um, and then as we heard this morning, of course, um, the African Studies Center also has lesson plans. I mean, all of our centers here at, at um, UIC have lesson plans available, um, but the African Studies Center also has uh, ones that were for uh, specifically for Francophone countries. So, you know, for in terms of your interest, I would look, we can um, get you that 
that link too. And I think um, it's a, it would be great to just have a look and see what's there. Um, and then you can reach out to us if you'd like more information, or we can also connect you with the person who wrote the lesson plan to see if there's more information that you might like. Um, that might be a great place to start. I hope that some of you um, have had some luck there and, and can um, can use those lesson plans in your in your classroom or or you know take bits and pieces you know from 10 different ones or whatever might make most sense. Um, but they're there for, for everyone to use. And we also have our teaching the EU toolkits um, for um, elementary, middle, and high school. And those are um, those have just been completely revamped after breakfast. After breakfast. <laughs> uh, also after breakfast, but actually after Brexit, um, make sure that they're as, as accurate as possible. And the, there are interactive uh, pieces and, and um, you know, maps. And really just we're trying to put things out there that you can pick and choose what works best in your classroom. So please, please have a look. I hope that helps a little bit, Helen. Yeah. Alina. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, I think that something that we need to address is that uh, language requirements are changing in the state of North Carolina. And we have been confronted with this at the North Carolina School of Science and Math, which is affiliated with the whole UNC system. And uh, a large percentage of our, our students, like I, don't know, I would say 80, 90% of the students go in state because they're offered a free tuition. So we were told that um, the UNC system, and I went to some one of these Board of Governor meetings, are no longer requiring two semesters of language to enter university, which was the requirement up to now. You had to have at least two semesters. So now that has changed to, you can replace that with a year, a, a science elective, another math class, computer science. Okay, so that that is going to change a lot because, okay, not all students go to university in states, but a lot of them do. And of course, the private university have maintained the require the language requirements of that that could create a system of of inequity. Um, and um, we were very disturbed in our humanities, this our humanities department, and specifically the world language discipline. Um, with with uh, my colleagues being concerned about their jobs status and how, how that's going to change the number of classes that they teach, um, and um, among other things. So the school is trying to address this. We've had several meetings and trying to determine if North Carolina School of Science and Mathematics still requires the students to graduate with two years of length of two semesters, at least of language, um, just to graduate from NCSSM, regardless of the, of the university requirement. But it's very, it's very hard justify that because they're wanting everything has to fall in line with what the UNC is doing so something that I think we all have to address and I don't know teachers from the other schools were aware of this this is changing that there's no longer a language requirement and it's and it's starting it's going to be starting I think starting as early as this fall yes. and it was kind of sneaky that they've kind of pushed that through um and we've done a lot of research about why why this is happening and speculation and um i don't know i think it's a lot of it has to do with like financial <laughs> um problems is that some there's been like lower enrollment recently through the covid years for some of the universities especially some of the ones out in the Western part of the state, smaller ones, and um, pretty crass to say it save money, but it, I think it has something to do with that. I, I don't know how we want to address this and how, how we can continue advocating for languages, which are very important. And thank you for sharing that because in Europe and in Asia, 
we need to graduate with at least two world languages, right? And that's a requirement, at least minimum two. So it's very interesting what you're saying right now about that we currently being changed for world languages. It may change though. Yeah. I wonder if that was brought up with like, the actual advocacy days or if mm -hmm. that wasn't on anyone's radar because as you said, it was small. It was kind of, right, and I've been, yeah. So, uh, David, um, do the French cultural services have toolkits like the one that um, Katie mentioned? Uh, and that would sort of lead us back to the uh, question we heard. And also then, what do the French cultural services do to promote language instruction in the Southeast? Mm -hmm. um, so I'm just sharing right now the... <clears throat> Our two uh, main uh, websites. Uh, the first one is uh, um, the French culture with a section for uh, K-12 uh, education, and here you can find all the all the uh, all the dimensions of our uh, resources and cooperation for French as a foreign language, for dual language, uh, French heritage. Uh, French schools, of course, and uh, well, uh, extracurricular French and Alliance Francaise. And here you can find uh, all the uh, grants, all the trainings that we organize during the year, uh, and different uh, resources for uh, uh, helping uh, teachers uh, in, the, in their class. Uh, the other uh, website that I just mentioned is on uh, face foundation and uh, it is about um, the new initiative French for all that the embassy of France has uh, launched uh, this year. Uh, you can go on this website and the French for all initiative has uh, four, uh, uh, four dimensions again, four initiatives. Uh, that are the French Heritage Language Program, the French Dual uh, Language Fund. And uh, I want to share with you, maybe you have seen that uh, at Georgia State University uh, from uh, the 20th to the 23rd of June, <clears throat> there will be a workshop for uh, dual language uh, French immersion teachers. And uh, there is a, a possibility for you to uh, register, if I am not wrong, uh, before the end of this month, the, the, the 31st. Uh, first. Uh, we have a new program for uh, French in higher education program and uh, a new pathways to teaching French program where we try to address the, pro the, the problem of uh, having uh, new French, uh, new teachers of French in the US. And the uh, of this program is to uh, train new generation of teachers. And so uh, we are here in the, in the Southeast, and I mentioned that in the, in the chat, we have a, a newsletter uh, called Southeast Education, where we try to share and all this information monthly. Uh, so if you want to uh, register to this uh, newsletter, you can uh, email me or email Lilian Daniels, and we will, uh, of course, uh, register you. What we can do, if you agree on that, is that as we have all your emails, we can uh, take the, uh, the liberty to, to, to send you, to, to register you. Uh, we will do that on Monday or, or Tuesday. And I know that some of you uh, never heard about this newsletter. Uh, so I think this is important that we, that we do that. Um, the, the final very important thing uh, for us uh, in the Southeast is that, um, uh, so I, I, I arrived 18 months ago, uh, as Kathleen said, and uh, uh, since, 2020, since 2020, we don't have uh, a program officer in charge of education cooperation in the Southeast. 
So our, my main goal and uh, the goal as well of uh, Mathieu Ossel, uh, in charge of education in Washington, is to, uh, was to convince the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in France to, uh, to create a new post uh, for education in the South Seas, because this is uh, really important for us. And uh, we struggled a lot. And uh, the good news is that we, we got this post. And so the good news that I can announce today is that we will have uh, someone in charge of education uh, starting next September for the Southeast. And it will allow us, because we are aware uh, that um, uh, personally I am in charge of, uh, for the Southeast of cultural education and higher education. So it's really difficult for me to, uh, to, to, to circulate a lot in the region, uh, to meet you and to have a local contact. Uh, so with this new uh, officer in charge of education, this problem I hope will be, uh, will disappear. And this person will uh, have as mission to, uh, to, to circulate everywhere in the, in the, in the Southeast to go to, to meet you, to meet uh, you at schools and universities. Uh, so um, this is a, an important step for our cooperation. And I, uh, we really hope by this way to, to, to have better, better contact with you and to help in your daily uh, work. That's great news, Debbie, that that's wonderful that you get a new person. I mean, personnel is so hard to get. That's that's fantastic news. Thanks for sharing. Oh yeah, you you, you cannot imagine how it how it is difficult for in this in in our time uh, to have the creation of a post uh, in the in the in the network of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. So uh, <laughs> it was really cha challenging, but we 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 get we got it. <laughs> Well, congratulations. Thanks for sharing. Questions that arose from our workshop and from our lunch discussion. Anything that came up that would be of interest to the group? I was going to bring up something that sort of piggyback, piggyback on one of the questions raised by uh, one of the Participants, I, I forgot her name on, on Zoom, about asked about material like centralized curricula for 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 students for grade levels, and I was having conversation with with two teachers who teach at elementary school, and and they were asking me about levels and curricula, and that it seems like they were seeing this for. But the high school high school classes, but what about like overall? Is there like a centralized place where where there are materials or where, where it's specified the levels like what 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 is level one consist of uh, anything like that? And I wasn't we're I wasn't aware of anything, and we're using the actual principles and guidelines, but is there a centralized bank of information curricula requirements in, in North Carolina. I mean, you, besides what you have at the centers of better near good studies. So I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> uh, what about the site, the NCDPI site with um, ML Gettner, who was here this morning. Uh, I know that they're the world language standards that are listed on there. I believe there are all sorts of other um, lesson plans and, and helpful. So I think that's a great resource to, to really start. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know within each of your counties, whether your schools would have kind of those connections uh, with each other. So that could be something else to reach out to. Um, if you're not involved with the, uh, you know, AATF, the American Association of Teachers of French. Um, so Lisa Bartels and teaches and in Apex and Wake County may also have quite a bit of resources. I believe they share, uh, um, they have resources. Uh, I don't know if it's on their site directly. Uh, you may have to log in once you remember. Yeah, there's the ATF has something. And uh, they have a bunch of different lessons. Um, also on Wakelet, there's a Wakelet, but 
um, they've transitioned that to the website and they've got a lot of resources where you can add your own and search by topic. It's mm -hmm. um, new, but with some of the news articles that we've talked about today from like Andrew Arnack to not, not that, um, the Set Jerusalem the Planet and all the Teve Saint Mold, all of those say the like European levels on them. So if there's something that you were wanting for like a novice, you could look for like A1 or A2, and those would correspond if you're trying to find something that's level. Those exist. Okay. It'd be nice to put some of the, we have some of those links up there. Yeah, yeah, we can put all of this. Mm -hmm. So, um, Leanne, are you <laughs> are you adding more to the wakelet as we speak? Um, I actually just went and added the AATF resources link where you can go in and search um, by name on the wakelet. Great. And then, how do we? Um, I'm sorry that I'm new to wakelet, so excuse me. <laughs> um, how do I? I just get everybody the link that's here in person. I just copied the link out of the. Absolutely, yeah. It's it's kind of like um, Pinterest on on steroids. Maybe you can add um links, but you can also add just text, images, upload PDFs, things like that as well. Okay. So another source that uh, I'm familiar with, um, because I've been part of the organization for a while, um, is the Modern Language Association (MLA), and uh, they, in recent years, have made it one of their um, points of effort um, to reach out uh, throughout K-12. So they have sort of branched out from college, uh, university to um, make it their, one of their missions to integrate um, the teaching of uh, languages, foreign languages from kindergarten to a college level. And so um, they have uh, kits available and I'm happy to um, send those um, and make them available. Um, but they, they have a lot of material and they, they are constantly adding to them. So uh, um, that's another good source. I would also add for a plug in for the Foreign Language Association of North Carolina. And I know Several of you have already presented there, or part of it, uh, are already involved, but flank.org, um, they have representatives for different regions. And so that could be someone to reach out to also, to reach out to your representative for that region and find out about resources for the area. And they have two conferences, one in the fall, one in the spring. Uh, the one in the fall was a couple of weeks ago, and the one in uh, when the spring was a couple of weeks ago. The one in the fall will be in Winston Salem in October and seventh and eighth. Any questions from the online participants? Um, I missed the, the, the other part. You say online certificate? Oh, no, online participants. If there were any questions from online participants. But we will, um, we, 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 today's a CEU day, so we can get you um, documentation for that too. So uh, then if there currently are no questions from the online participants, um, we had a few discussions here and one of the topics that arose from several conversations was study abroad and uh, how we could uh, do more to uh, advertise it in the schools, middle and high school, and how we could connect it, better connect it to the universities and what we could do to make um, resources available, make experiences available. Um, and so um, I would, would like to, uh, um, well, invite everyone to uh, ask part, uh, particular questions and also David and Katie to sort of chime in on that. I, I'm, I'm, I can't, I don't know, before Mr. David can talk. I wanted to say the study abroad um, for French teacher will benefit the teacher as well as the student. The focus is always on the student, 
but I believe if you can um, put resources or help, I know um, I, I deal a lot with um, the embassy of, uh, in Atlanta. Um, they always have this um, email that they send to apply, but I don't know who's all, always selected. I don't know how the selected happened, but I have been applying. I've never been selected, but I think if it's, it's not a selection because I don't know how they select, but people can't say I'm willing to do this and this is how I can do it. And then they can help. That will be good for teacher also to go for a few months and come back. Um, it would be great. So this would be yeah. faculty led study abroad um, K-12 something like that. Um, David, is something, are there are there resources, funds available, uh, grants that would support faculty-led study abroad K-12? Um, yeah, so I, I am sorry that Madame Godet, you've never been selected. Uh, there, is a, there is a jury uh, in Washington who is in charge of that. Um, what you could do uh, at the moment of the application is to uh, to send me an email, for instance, my email is in the in the chat right now, and for us to be aware uh, before the the deadline of the application that uh, you do that, we we will be aware of your of your uh, applications, and we can discuss with our colleagues in Washington uh, to to make the connection. It's uh, I does not mean by this that uh, you will be automatically selected uh, if you if you are in contact, but we are here to uh, to be in between Washington, I would say, and you. Uh, so never hesitate to, to do that, uh, please. Yeah. But uh, I am not, for, just, just, to, just to tell you that I am not uh, 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 in the jury. Uh, making the, the, the final decision. But we can make recommendation. Um, from the center's perspective, and um, I would I would say I can speak for the other centers on our um, third floor, right? So we, uh, for those of you who don't know, we have the Institute for the Study of the Americas, European Studies, Eastern European Studies, Russia, um, doing it in order, Asia, uh, Middle East, and Africa. And uh, we go around the hallway that way. Um, and we all, so so none of us have funding to send students, kids, um, you know, K through 12 students. We do potentially, potentially have funding to send teachers. Um, so I think that that's something that if you're interested in a particular world region and your French language teaching, um, it, you know, you're welcome to reach out to me and I can connect you, uh, but I think that is worth a, a discussion with our other centers. The, the money that we get from the US Department of Education, uh, it's a four year grant and we're entering, we're in year one right now. So there's some time to, to discuss, you know, a lot of things of course are pitched in the proposal right away and they, you know, the programs we have for four years, but but there is some, some, um, some potential there um, and everyone, um, as particular, they're all you know eager to, to have feedback from from teachers themselves. So um, that that is a, a possibility to look into. Um, we also um, you know for things like exploratory research, sometimes that could work if you are hoping to lead a, a trip um, or for your own professional development. You know something combined like that, you could potentially pitch something that could be. Now we we don't have. Um, it's not times, but maybe with a little bit of money from your district and some money from us, right? We could put something together like that. Mm -hmm. Things like that, I think, are possible. Um, we offer the Brussels Study Tour, which is, I mean, I can talk about, um, which is specific on the EU, um, but it's a week long, um, six day trip, look at the EU institutions. Um, and it's, um, we give you a grant, $1,300 for airfare and the, hotel is paid for and one big meal and breakfast is in. Um, there's an admin fee that we ask for, um, but the rest is covered. Um, and we take a day trip new. We take a day trip to Luxembourg to see the Court of Justice, which is really exciting. I, I love it. Um, anyway, <laughs> but that's something that we've done um, for many, many, many years. And the program always evolves. And people are really, um, well, I hope, I mean, I can say it too, but it's, um, 
you, um, and again, people who've gone on the Brussels Day Tour are the ones creating less, some of the ones creating lesson plans and that emergent, right? So um, as you're describing this emergent for teachers, we know that you're the multipliers, you're the ones who bring it home. Um, and, and that's why we provide professional development. And it, yeah, we've had something for a few years, this uh, learning through languages. Yeah, <laughs> yes. And then we were able to bring students with like a research yeah. project in the target language and mm -hmm. they came here and they presented and I was able to do this for two years in a row. Yes. Once it was via Zoom during COVID right. when it was before. And yes. the students were really excited about that and they were hoping to do it this year too. Yeah. But they said no, we there had the, funding for that no, again. Right. The funding yeah. um so it's um and actually Kristen was just bringing it up. We've talked about it um it didn't close because we didn't have any more interest. It was very, uh, it, it's, a, it's really exciting. So basically, um, just to elaborate, um, all of the area study centers got together and worked on bringing, uh, on reaching out to teachers who would, um, who would integrate this presentation into their curriculum. And in December, students were able, teachers were able to bring their students to campus and the whole atrium and the first floor and the second floor were full of students presenting in their language. It had like poster boards. Yes, exactly. And and Dorothea and Valerie were judges, and we had it um, Japanese, Chinese, Arabic, uh, German, you name it, Spanish across the board. Um, and then there would be prizes and all the things. And um, an outreach coordinator from all six of our centers participated, and it was you know months and months of work, but also the funding. It's a, it costs a lot to do it because we. Our goal is to never have you all pay. I mean, we know you put resources in, I don't mean to say, you know, but but we we give you mileage, we give the teachers a stipend, some supplies, right? So, and then there's, you know, lunch. so we can get, right, there's food, which we have to ask, beg the dean for because we can't pay for food ourselves. Um, anyway, there's a lot that goes into it and um, and every single center has to be on board and every single center has to provide money. It's it's just, um, so we, we actually just talked today, Kristen, brought it up, we've wanted to talk about it to see if we can bring it back on a smaller scale um, and to see how we can how we can manage it. Um, you know, we maybe we just don't have trophies and t-shirts. We can cut those costs, you know, see how we could do it. Yeah. Um, and but coming in person makes a really big difference. It's a big difference. Um, and there we learned all sorts of rules about who's allowed to talk to kids on Zoom, who isn't. <laughs> so that presenting on Zoom was a problem. There's a, an office for protection of minors. You know, thank goodness. I mean, I, I totally understand, but that meant that I wasn't allowed to talk directly to the students online, right? It had to go through. So there was all sorts of things that just don't make the online experience what it needs to be. So we do want to make sure there's money to bring you guys to campus and have the students, you know, so maybe, you know, I don't, I'm willing to brainstorm and I can do things on a shoestring budget. I'm not afraid of that at all, but where's, you know, we need to make sure the impact is, is, uh, can really be beneficial. Um, so I'm happy to discuss. Like the schools from the triangle, that I don't think that's such a problem with commute transportation. Yeah. Okay. They could just take a school whole school day and take yeah. a bus and, and come here. Yeah. I mean, further schools that might yeah. need money for them. Right. You know, so you did it on a shoestring budget. Yeah. You kind of prioritize. Right. Right. That's yeah. We'd have to figure out a way to make that. But coming back to study abroad, I think yeah. Emily, um, did you lead a study abroad this summer? I did not lead it. Um, okay. I worked for CIEE um, for the first session, and it was my first year ever working for it. Um, and I filled in, they were needing less than it, French teachers to help. Um, and the school itself was run by French teachers, and then I just was like coordinator, mom, like program leader. So the flight over the flight back so it is an opportunity that's out there and they do offer a lot of scholarships um for that and that's c-i-e-e mm -hmm. right or yes that's the can i ask you a question about study abroad Sorry. um i'm really curious about how the kids pay for it um, <laughs> definitely your face. Yeah, please. Um, go for it. <laughs> for my kids, 
I present a trip two years in advance. And they have to sign up that far in advance to pay for it. Okay. Um, and that's how they pay for it. A lot of them have to get jobs with their parents' help. But I do feel like there's a large population at our school that can't go. Right. Just because it's not financially feasible for them. Right. So offering it years in advance so that they have more time to pay it. Yeah, you have smaller uh, payments per month. Okay. That's one way that we do it. Okay. And that's thank you. And do you um I mean, yeah, planning, I'm sure COVID was helpful in that regard. Um, but that means that they may also do fundraisers or car washes or bake sales and things like that to raise money. Yeah. And how many students do you take? How big can the group be? I mean, as many sign up. This summer, I'm taking about 40. Um, to oh my God. London and Paris. And then this summer, I'm not going to go to London for going to Japan. Wait, where are you going this summer? Say again. London and Paris. And you're taking 40 kids. But how many grown ups are going? So there's probably around 30 kids, and we have an adult for every six kids. Okay. Wow. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. That's really impressive. Yeah. Thank you for sharing. Um, yeah. Just giving a plug. So AATF, mm -hmm. um, North Carolina, our chapter for our members, we offer a couch scholarship that's for university students. And we've done that for a number of years. Okay. But now we are also opening up. Um, it's in its infancy, so we, it's not launched yet. But we're going to offer a scholarship for a North Carolina student to go and do, like for high school age, to do that kind of program. So it's already offered for the college, but now we're going to try and do the same program because we have a pot of money to pull from. So that's North Carolina Association, American Association of Teachers of French. And what's the scholarship for? Um, well, I don't know that we've named it. Like we're so on we're the, the, the one couch. that was, exists as the couch scholarship. Build a couch scholarship. I thought you said couch, and then I thought yeah. I so, <laughs> yeah. yeah. And then we haven't, we've just started the planning of the next plan because we're going to follow the same model, but um, right now we want to make sure that it goes to a student in need. So we're trying to figure out like for in Haywood County, how they do our scholarships for our um, Haywood County Schools Education Foundation is based on the FAFSA report. Yeah. But um, we were floating the idea of maybe going off of free and reduced lunch numbers or some other metric to where we get those students that just can't afford because most of the students in my district um, can't. So um, how many would be funded by this? Um, it's still in its, like how much, it just depends on how much money we can get as to how many we can afford. Yeah. Um, I think it was main uh, maybe two thousand where it would help with like the air fear or something i mean it's a, a modest but something to help i mean that would help huge for a kid that really is passionate about learning. that would be one scholarship per year i think so yeah that's how it is for us yeah there's there's another scholarship i don't know if you're familiar with the national security language initiative and sl i dash y it's funded by the government and I, it's connected with Fulbright but they're, they're they encourage students to learn less known languages so Chinese Arabic Korean Russian and it's it's for high school students it could be even for ninth graders any high school student can you say that name one more time and and it's the initials are N S L I Y NSLI dash Y, so it's National Security Language Initiative for Youth. You can put that on the screen. They have a, a website and um, it's an application process. It's, it's, it's a little bit extensive. Students have to write two or three essays. Oh, okay. And it's a, it, it's an all paid summer program, totally immersive, where they spend, I think, six to eight weeks in the country. You know, like Morocco, like Rabat, or uh, India, and they live with families, and they're learning this less commonly known language, and it doesn't matter if they've had 
if they don't know anything of the language or if they haven't had language, just interest in travel and language. And they need a recommendation from a faculty member and they take students from all over the US. It's it's a little bit competitive, but if the student really wants to do it and writes excellent ex essays and gets a good recommendation, they have a, a pretty good shot at getting it. At our school, we have be sometimes between two and five students who get it each year. And then, um, oh, okay. yeah, and there's interviews, and you can go for the whole summer, but you could also do a gap year, yeah. like a whole year living abroad, and it's all paid for, everything is paid for. So it's something worth learning about. It's funded by the State Department. Yeah. More money than <laughs> yeah, so that's it. Do you know when the application process? It, the application is in the fall. Yeah. It's in the fall. It's okay. in the fall. I, would say I, I think, okay. yeah, yes. Yeah. So if you have a student that you can think of, if you could encourage it and we didn't used to do it a, a lot at the school, but then it became popular and students who did it at the university come back in the fall and do presentations about how awesome their trip yeah. was and then it would get all the language students interested in doing that and it would also like get them to be more interested in taking languages yeah right so awesome yeah it's in the fall i think it's it ends around like shortly in, in regular okay yeah. i have a question for for us, we are pretty much new in the country. And going back to what we, Madame Conte was talking about teachers, I would like to know if there are like initiatives or projects that teachers are involved in that sometimes, as we were talking earlier, with someone here in the, the, in the cloud, in the room, we don't have the time to interact or to learn from other teachers. Like it's always us. So I wonder if there is some the activities or if that teachers from other say, counties are invited to. I think that goes back to Plank. So that's the foreign language station in North Carolina. Yes. It's, um, there's a different location. They alternate between locations. There's one in the fall and one in the spring. And that's a huge meeting place for all world language teachers, not just in French. Um, so also speak all the languages that are taught in North Carolina. And the next one's October the 7th, 7th. in Winston-Salem. And then uh, in the spring, it will be March 2nd in Greenville. So it should be in Winston-Salem probably for two to three years. And then it will essentially come back to uh, RDU, Raleigh-Durham area. For the next few years, so it's they switch around. And are you aware of other activities that go along the year and not just during as Um, well, in the, so Anne Marie Venture that we met this morning, there's a list serve that you can join through NCDPI, and they any workshop like this workshop was published there. So anything that happens, um, she Anne Marie is really good at sharing those um, opportunities for teachers. So they're not often, um, we would love more of them, but whenever they are, she always shoots. On a much different level than all of that, I get a lot out of my foreign language or French language teacher Facebook pages. And I feel like there's a wealth of ideas and sharing and examples and student work and activities and songs and links. And it's not, it's different, but it's daily and it's always. So one is French Teachers in the U.S., the Facebook group. There's also um, um, uh, Music Mercury, so like the song activities. There's Manning Music Cow, which I can't say enough about, and that's only in the spring, but it gives you a network of teachers to correspond with and collaborate with. Those are those are my three. Could you share? Yeah. Those? Yeah. yeah, so the Facebook group is French Teachers in the U.S. 
she got it. And then um, the music competition that I've plugged everywhere I get the opportunity is Mene Musical. So um, M A N I E and then musical, like oh, you think of it. Yeah. And that is, if for anyone not that I haven't told yet today, it's like the NCAA bracket and it's 16 songs that they have picked from all different French speaking um, um, countries, not just France. And they, the students vote on them instead of it being a basketball game, it's the students are voting. Um, and this year we have uh, 4,300 schools participating. Uh, so that's all 50 states, all the Canadian provinces, New Zealand joined us this year. And it's a huge engagement tool using current music, but also making connections to sports. And that gives kids that aren't really good at sports an opportunity to be, well, I have my own bracket. And like the teachers at the schools come up with the prizes. Um, but along with that, there's art contests. There's Flipgrid where the students are interacting with other French students from the same countries, giving their opinions on the songs or just little introductions, you know, where they're from. Um, so it's a huge thing that happens. This year we started a little earlier than what I remember is starting in the past, um, but it's the month of March. So even if you, it's too late to sign up, but you can still have your students using the resources because they're all free to share. Um, you can still have your students voting. Um, they just won't be on the participant map. Um, but it's a wonderful, resource to connect you to other teachers and other activities. They have an art contest where you produce a piece of art on either the song or the, the artist, and then um, they have to describe it in French. And then, so it has both pieces, the creative piece and the French communication. Um, and then the other Facebook group was um, Music Very Pretty, and they focus on using songs, obviously not only the Obviously, on Wednesday, what you just said. Mere pretty means Wednesday. Sorry. The two non French speakers. Those are my like online fields. And so that's how I connect. Like, you can look daily. And you can use the search function, which I can't recommend enough in Facebook groups. If you don't know, you can use the search function to search for whatever you're teaching. So whatever topic you're struggling with, or you hit a wall, or there's a standard you're trying to reach, you just type it in and someone's already done it. And they've given you a copy and said, here, use this, please. So work smarter, not harder. Thank you. Are there any other Facebook groups that you use? Um, I really like the CI one. Like, um, what's it called? It's uh, CI. It stands for Comprehensible Input. Yeah. Um, but, <laughs> as we pull up our Facebooks and see what groups are in them. Yeah. Comprehensible Input Teachers Lounge, is that it? I haven't done that. And did that sound oh, CI for French Teachers. It's CI for French yeah, CI for French Teachers. Oh, compelling okay. and Comprehensible Input. Okay. Yeah, okay. There's also one that I'm involved in that might be uh, good for you. It's Le Prof de F-L-E-O Enfant. And so they have like a shared Google Drive that they share things and lessons that it's gate, uh, geared toward younger learners. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, what was that one, Emily? Um, it is the live here. I'll just walk over there okay. and you can see it. Uh, on screen. Guys, <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, Thank you. There's one for teachers of AP French um, that I'm a member of that's good. There's um, what else? 
Uh, Ala Tolda Barbara, she does some great resources and worksheets. And then the um, Area Studies Outreach Program also has a Facebook group. <laughs> Instagram has been most um, active recently. I feel like that's how we reach young people best. Um, yeah. I use I use quite a few of Instagram. Oh, good. I'm part of certain groups also on on Facebook, but I do find so for a part back to news and such. So I do receive yeah. news from different departments there. Uh, but I also, I find Instagram is often a good way to just find snippets. So instead of a whole article of just showing, oh, you know, uh, as I mentioned before, we only had five different pictures. And yes, there's a picture, but there's an explanation. And there's just a little short paragraph. And you can just cut and paste or take pictures and put them on a slide. And then one slide just show the story um, in essence. So keeping it short. Um, works well for Instagram or even sometimes it's just about liking different museum signs. Mm -hmm. Um just something very short as a as a quick warm up to, to then move on and introduce the topic it works really well. Um, so it doesn't always have to be an article, it doesn't always have to be long. It can be we talk about videos, right? Short videos or video that's two minutes and be as impactful as, as something that's longer, right? I think it's we might check out students might check it after a few minutes if it's too long, if it's too much to read, or something very short, the same thing. Um, you know, uh, this a slide or two or a couple of pictures on Instagram sometimes also is a great conversation starter. I have a colleague, Carolyn Holcutt, she's at Morrisville High, um, also a member of NCAATF, and she shares on a Padlet. So she'll screenshot an Instagram post and puts them on the Padlet, and that's their warm up activity every day. So they have to engage with whatever she's posted. And so it's an easy way for her to start class. Um, I got this from the French teachers in the US, but I call my bell ringers like when they come in, they're Quasimodos. And so that's what she does, it's her introduction activity, and she's had a lot of success with it. And I've created, like, so I have a Instagram and Twitter is at Pisgah French. And I share, like, in the stories, I'll share things. And I'm not allowed to follow students, but they found me and they follow me. And so I found that's a way to just, like, throw things out there that they might, and they'll ask me about it in class. Or they'll be like, hey, I, I really like that story. Like, you know, and I went down this rabbit hole because of it. So it's just a way to just like it doesn't take me long to just reshare something in a story and then it's engaging them and I haven't even used like a lesson plan. Like then they're using it on their own. Um, can I do one thing further one of my main resources is the Fond du Cray and uh, you can find great uh, activities for students and you know if you yeah. uh, so also Facebook, there, uh, there are different pages and groups uh, uh, which uh, are connected with the point of today where you can find uh, work of your colleagues to, to have a conversation and to exchange the activities and uh, anything you do. We can hear you. Thank you. Oh, oh, you're welcome. <laughs> Joseph, please. I'm sorry, I didn't hear. <laughs> Are there any more questions from the online participants, comments, observations, concerns? If not, then we'd like to thank David for making his appearance. Thank you very much. David, are you there? Yeah, I'm here, of course. Uh, thank you all uh, for this wonderful workshop. Uh, this afternoon, and thank you for sharing all this great information. I learned a lot uh, during this last hour as well. Thank you. Thank you, David, and your team, of course. Thank you, Dorothea, really. Yeah, thank you, Dorothea. Thank you, Kathleen. Thank you, Valerie. 
Merci, Monsieur David. <laughs> thanks to all of you for being here in person. Thanks to everyone on Zoom. I, I love that we could get together for all these resources together. So we'll be sending you a lot of information and let's figure okay. out how to keep the conversation going. Um, uh -huh. And like I said before, please keep us posted of things that are going on, that, what you'd like to see more of, how we can do support. Even if we can just do a brainstorming, you know, if you just want to talk to see who we might know and connect you with somebody else, um, it never hurts to talk at least. So uh, thanks so much for spending your Saturday with us. We really appreciate it. <laughs> Have a good afternoon. Thank you all. So those who are here, just to throw out a question, if we were to do this again, what would you like?